What is going on, everybody? Hope you are having a good week so far. So I'm really excited about um, for you all to listen to this one uh, on the podcast today is Charlene Hector. Charlene is quite possibly one of my favorite singers I've ever worked with. And she's also one of the nicest people on this planet. Um, she has literally done everything <laughs> and quite amazingly um, smashed every thing that she's done um i love having a conversation with her uh we actually hung out in london a couple of weeks ago which was actually the first time met in person um we've been speaking f probably for about uh probably about a year now i would say um and then we did a couple of zoom sessions and we're working on a few more records um but charlene hector is just an amazing person um and super talented as well. So without further ado, Charlene Hector. And we are live, Charlene Hector. How the devil are you? How's, first of all, happy birthday for yesterday. And second of all, how's the headache? <laughs> I'm so sick, Will. I'm so sick. <laughs> I'm, I like really appreciate you coming on because you sent me a video at like, half 11 last night and everyone was still with you right. you were like oh you know I hope you're getting rest i was like nope <laughs> yeah but it was it was a beautiful night a lovely time but i'm paying for it now definitely yeah that hangover life is yeah it's, it's the one thing that like because i don't drink i yeah. like i like to just rub it in my mates faces every time they're hungover <laughs> <laughs> when you get it's like after 40, hangovers are like 50 times worse. So I remember I never used to get hangovers. Yeah. And I used to drink a lot more than I do now. And um, and then after 30, it was like, why, why do I feel like the world is spinning? Like, what's going on? <laughs> but yeah. I gave I gave up when I was 21. Those hangovers just weren't enough for me then. I was just couldn't deal with it the next day. I was like, nope, this is... <laughs> I got too much to do. Yeah, too this is not happening for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh god! Oh god! But happy How birthday. are you? You all right? I'm good. I'm good. I so the other day I shaved my hair off. Like I got my barber to just like fully shave my hair off. Yeah. And uh, the reason why I was late was because I just like shaved my hair for the first time, like myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and I took a picture at the back of my head in the mirror, and yeah. I was like still patchy. So I was like, oh fuck's sake! <laughs> I, have to, I have to sort this out now. Yeah, I can't just do this. And also, I apologize. My studio is an absolute mess right now i've listen like, don't worry don't worry there's no judgment here it's fine you can judge me it's totally fine <laughs> i would judge me it's awful i'm i've like rewired my whole studio and like my dad built me a new synth stand yes, and i saw it. it looks amazing it's getting there but it's still like if you saw the, the i don't know if you'd be able to see the floor but it's just like yeah. ocd <laughs> madness <laughs> It's all right. Don't worry. It's all good. Happy, happy bank holiday weekend. Happy bank holiday weekend. It's May. What, they call it May Day or something. Yeah, although it's technically not the first of day, first of May, is it? It's not. It's the third now. Yeah. This year is going so fast. It's crazy. Oh my days! We're nearly halfway through. Yep. How? Yeah, nearly there. I can't. <sighs> I'm kind of looking forward to this year being over already yeah. and I, I, I'm, I'm not really one for like I'm not really one to like wish my life away mm -hmm. but I think it's ready for this to be bloody over <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's been a strange old time hasn't it and it's like I think a lot of people just want to get back to normal life um but what will normal life be like after this that's the question really isn't it so, I don't know in Liverpool over the weekend obviously they had the like 3,000 people raving like yeah yeah, they did. They wow. did. Um, Yousef uh, run a circus event with. It was kind of like a test for COVID. Oh yes, I think I heard they were going to do that. Yeah. Like yeah, like they did two nights, three thousand people mm -hmm. raving, and I love how they like do experiments on this. They did one in Amsterdam, but they chose the Scousers to do the experiments on you. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> they love it, way, isn't it? <laughs> experimenting on the people them so yeah but um let's uh let's let's start this off with 
Charlene Hector is the lady who sang my record on my record Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> and it's really strange because I didn't like, I obviously I, I knew who you were from a long time, Aww. but I didn't really know like how much you'd like subconsciously been part of my music life for a long time yeah. and it kind of like yeah because I remember when we had dinner the other night and I was yeah. talking to you about when we were at Glastonbury when my dad and I were at Glastonbury yeah. and watched you uh perform live at Basement Jacks I didn't know that was you for ages <laughs> yeah and like I guess now it's like that full circle um but I want to kind of go back, like, what was it, where did it start for you, really? For me, my love of music started in church. So if you imagine I was three years old, um, listening to live music, basically, mm. and falling in love with the whole thing. And uh, I used to get really upset when the songs were over. And I don't know if you've ever been to <clears throat> a Black Pentecostal church, but the singing tends to go on for quite a while. Mm. So um, that was what I loved. And uh, my grand, she, she's passed now, but she always used to tell this story every birthday about how when I was three years old, they were singing this song that I really loved and I stood up on the chair and I stabbed with my foot and singing along as best as I could. And then when the song finished, I just carried on. So I was like, no, I'm not ready for this to end. And I just carried on singing, making up big noise in the chair. And I think I've, I've been making up big noise ever since, yeah. really. So, yeah, it's, it, I think that's where my love of music and harmony and all of that kind of stuff um, came from. But I never had any, not really any formal training. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that, I'd, I'd say it started there. Do you still go to church and sing? I don't anymore, no. I used to um as an adult but I think <clears throat> touring life kind of took over mm. and also my I don't want to say my beliefs changed because they haven't yeah. but my feelings about church changed okay well and, what what uh, changed if you don't mind me asking um I think it was I kind of became a commodity I felt I should say I felt like I became a commodity I don't think anybody intentionally um wanted to make me feel like I was something some, something to be used yeah i did feel a bit like that um my welfare i didn't feel that my welfare was something that they were particularly interested in mm. i think they were more um interested in what i do mm. and obviously we know as artists that we are not what we do even though it's a massive part of who we are it isn't who we are it's not our ide identity exactly. is it yeah so because I've always had quite a strong idea about my identity, I kind of spotted <clears throat> when, you know, that was kind of not, not the case anymore. And it mm. wasn't, they're not looking at me as a person. They look, oh, when can you sing? And when can you play? And when can you? Yeah. And it wasn't so much, how are you? Mm. And I'm all about how are you? Yeah, That's, yeah. I want to know how you're doing. Are you okay in your heart, in your mind? Because sometimes if you're not, it might be best for you not to be, there. on the stage at yeah. church but I was never really asked that unless mm. it was in the context of will you be at church on Sunday yeah, to sing? yeah. so yeah so do you do would you class yourself as a religious person um I think I'm probably religious in the wider sense of the word like the way people who are not religious mm. see religious people but I wouldn't say I'm religious no yeah I say I'm spiritual yeah I believe in God mm -hmm. um I believe in my ancestors yeah. I believe we're guided by <clears throat> loads of people that came before us. I believe in intuition. I believe in, you know, being led yeah. by the spirit hundred percent, but I wouldn't say I was a religious person. Yeah. Do you think religion's important in society? Important in society? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean to push up my face like that. <laughs> <laughs> Religion has caused so many issues and problems and so mm. many wars so I don't know if religion itself is is a good thing. I think the tolerance that is lacking in a lot of religions is what causes the problem. Mm. Um, I think people need to be more... Like, I remember when I first, you know, started going to school and I'd, I'd grown up in a very Christian home, so mm. I assumed everyone was a yeah. Christian. So when I met people who weren't Christians, I was like... <laughs> Don't you know you're going to hell? Like, yeah. <laughs> they're looking at me like, are you cool? Like, oh, this is awful. I must tell you about Jesus. And I had a very um, proactive um, 
attitudes towards yeah. telling people about Jesus and heaven and hell and all that kind of stuff. And then um, I met some Muslims and I met some gay people yeah. and I met some Jewish people and the rich, the richness of the tapestry, I guess, of people mm. that I met just kind of changed my mind about a lot of stuff. Yeah. So that's why I would say I'm not religious, but I think religion in society causes more problems than it does. I think if people acted more out of love than out of the basis of their religion, yeah. then I think we'd be in a better place, to be honest. I don't disagree with you, to be fair. Um, yeah. I'm not like a, I'm not a religious type, um, mm. but I do, I believe in community. And I think sometimes a religion does bring community together. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's really, really important. Um, however, I, I think it's just when people push their beliefs on other people, it's like, dude. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't have I to believe. It's like, I mean, it's fine for community to be created, but I think when you get people being directly excluded because they are not necessarily part of that community, mm. That that for me is problematic. I feel like, as as Christians, we need to be more welcoming. Yeah. I can't speak for any other religion, but for myself, I think all religions, uh, you know, should be more welcoming. But I can't say that from a perspective of somebody who believes, you know, I don't want to say who who, do, who believes in other religions, but I just I just think that there can be a little bit of exclusive exclusivity and a little bit of cliqueiness, mm. especially in church from my experience. So yeah. I think the cliqueiness is, is even though, yes, it's great to have community, I think there definitely needs to be more openness amongst other communities, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. It's, it's so strange how, like, a couple of books has, like, ruled the world for so many years. And, yeah. like, no disrespect, it's just, like, men and women have written these books. Mm -hmm. Well, mostly men. <laughs> It it's does. like yeah. it, and it's like there's some like even the some like the mormon community the like mm. scientology is like it's modern day yeah. <laughs> it's, it's modern yeah. day stories and you're just like yeah i don't know yeah however <laughs> however <laughs> do you i somebody asked me because a lot of my records are like based around i guess religion which is weird because i'm yeah. not religious at all like yeah. a lot of like i guess hallelujah obviously was a candy statin record like but she's extremely religious as, as a person yeah. um and a lot of her songs are um mm -hmm. my record with mk like a track called my church like again that's kind of religion i've got a record coming out called father i've got a record so i'm just like somebody was like dude are you are you religious mm. and i was like I'm, I'm really not but there's something about gospel there's something the feeling that gospel songs give me is just something that no other music gives me mm -hmm. and it sounds cheesy as fuck, but no, it doesn't. No, like what I'm gonna say, so it's kind of a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, oh, wait. Oh, hold on. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> the I I I look at personally, I look at religion as like community, mm. and being able to play these records very loud in a club is like creating a community. And it's not great. I don't, I wouldn't want a religion. I wouldn't want anything like, but mm. the, the records, especially gospel records, just do something different on the dance floor. Yeah, it's true. And it, it's, it's really funny that you say that because I was just part of a panel a couple of days ago. Um, I think it was called access all area seminars. They're mm. on Instagram and they, um, they asked me to come because one of the organisers and I, we used to be in the same kind of church circles together as performers. Yeah. He was in a group called um, Green Jade and I was in a group called Basic, which stood for Brothers and Sisters in Christ. Okay. And um, <laughs> so we were always on the same, the same bills, so we'd always bump into each other. And he, he rang me up 
a few weeks back and said, look, we're doing a, a seminar on Zoom and, and we'll also be in a studio as well. Mm. But uh, we want to talk about the intersectionality, intersectionality of gospel music. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if I'm the right person or I haven't been to church in a while. And he's like, no, this, this is great. This yeah. is what we want to talk about. And and a lady called Natalie, <coughs> excuse me, from House Gospel Choir, she was saying that that's the thing when you're in the club mm. and everybody is singing, you know, some big old gospel song, it gives you a feeling of, like you said, community. And it gives you a feeling of of, of unity. Mm. And I think that that's the thing about gospel music is that it does bring people together. Yeah. And that's what I mean about communities, including people. But I think that's the thing about music. It brings people together. Yeah. And, you know, you can have people that don't even believe in, in Jesus or believe that Jesus is God or anything like that. But when they start singing about it, it's like there's a... There's a feeling because there, there is a spirit realm. Mm, there is. And yeah. it's just that is what people feel when they start singing about that kind of thing, you know? No, I totally agree. It's it's something special. I still haven't been to a gospel church in Detroit. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I need you to haven't. go. No, I need to go. In Detroit? Yeah, I live right, like literally down the road from one. Um, but it's always on Sundays and I'm always touring when sure. I'm in Detroit. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm never there. <laughs> um but yeah it's it's it is i i don't know what it is it's just something and i think also it's like a universal music really like robert hood um and his his daughter uh they they have the like duo called floor plan i don't know if you've heard of them oh my god you have to check them out it's just yeah. unbelievable stuff yeah. and there is like theirs is like very it's like techno mm. gospel, really. Wow. Um, but there's just something like it. It it's not one set genre. You're not yeah. like with when you've got a gospel song on the record. It doesn't matter what genre it is. It works in all in all walks of life. It works in every DJ set. You could have like some cheesy EDM DJ play, it, or you could have some super underground techno artist play it, and it just works all in yeah. all aspects. Yeah, it's unifying. It is. There isn't anything else like it, to be fair. Special, special thing, definitely. Yeah. So, how did the whole basement jacks thing happen? I want to know about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord. Um. Okay. So, two thousand and one. Mm. I think around July, I'd never been to an audition before. Mm. Um, for anything, I just, you know would just go and do stuff. People say, are you free to do stuff? And yeah. I, I would do it um, or not, as case may be. But I was in a choir called LCGC mm -hmm. and they had uh, attached to the choir. They had an agency called Choir Connection where they would send people out on sessions for yeah. different artists and stuff like that. So I think uh, Basement Jacks got in touch with them and said, can you send us some girls to, you know, mm. audition? And at the time there was a lot of this kind of skinny white girls were what people wanted. Mm. So, you know, the fact that they would, they, all they wanted was somebody who could sing. They didn't care what that person looked like or where that person was from. Yeah. Can they sing these songs? Well, that's yeah. all we want, but we need someone with a big voice. So I went to the audition. I hadn't really heard of much. I, I didn't know. There were a lot of songs I but I'd heard by Basement Jacks, but I didn't know it was them. Yeah, yeah. So um, when I went to the audition, um, I, did, I didn't really have anything mm. pre to prepare. They, I was just like, just go and they'll tell you what to sing. So I was like, okay. So I went and uh, what Felix did was he, um, he put me in the booth because I think they basically recorded all the auditions. Yeah. And he put me in the booth and then he'd go on the talk back and say, you keep on giving me the hold up. And then asked yeah. me to sing it back. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so embarrassing but i was just like i know this stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> i did everything that he told me to do sang everything he told me to sing and he's like you know do your thing i was like yeah <laughs> stuff. Like, i was 23 at the time wow. and then after i came out of the booth i was like so have i got the job then because yeah. that, that's what you know yeah, yeah. right or wrongly that's what i was used to it's like i, I don't audition i, yeah. I simply you know yeah. i simply arrive <laughs> <laughs> With my big head. <laughs> so I was like, have I, have I got the job then? And they were like, well, we just need to see a couple more people and then 
you know, when, you know, know. I was like, oh, oh, okay. So then I, I, I left and um, obviously, I, I, again, I'd never been to an audition, so I didn't know how long I'd have to wait to find out. Mm. I, I was nervous and, you know, really kind of anxious about it. And then Basil Mead, who runs LCGC, um, called me and I said, okay, so, you know, they saw a lot of people, but they've decided they want to go with you. Yeah. And I screamed. I was so happy. But I forgot to hang up the phone. <laughs> I was screaming like, ah, oh my gosh. And it was like, okay, Charlene, bye. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. You know, really embarrassing. Again, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> very embarrassing few months. And then 9-11 happened. Yeah. And uh, everyone cancelled their tours. Mm. Uh, literally everyone. No one wanted to fly. And I remember being at home because we were due to leave on September 21st. Yeah. And I remember being at home watching the news. And then um, Mancy, uh, Basement Jackson's manager, called and said, look, um, we're having to reconsider whether or not we're going to do this tour, mm. whether or not it's going to go ahead. So I'm just keeping you in the loop and stuff. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, we're not going to go or whatever. But what they did, which is something that the Jacks boys have always made us feel, everyone that's involved, always made us feel like we're part of a group. Mm. And what they did was they said, who wants to go? And everyone was happy to go. So yeah. we went and we didn't come home for about three months and we Amazing. went everywhere. Um, so, yeah, that was that was almost, yeah, that was almost 21 years ago now. Yeah. Damn. Mm-hmm. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, it was. And it, uh, still, to date, it has been the best touring experience of my life being yeah. in that group. And I've done a lot of other stuff since then. But, you know, just the vibe. I think we were spoiled as well because mm. they didn't treat us like, you know, the background. Yeah, yeah. Like, like if, I remember one day, I can't, rem- I can't remember where we were, but we were in some foreign country and they had some interviews to do. Mm. So... They just said to us, look, we're going to do this radio thing. Who wants to come? Yeah. And so we were all like, yeah, 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 let's go. So there's all of us and they let us answer questions and that's stuff, sick. you know. And that's really unusual because then after that, I was doing some work with Brand New Heavies and they had interviews and I was like, can I come? Because I thought that's what you do. I yeah. thought you all go together. Again, very inexperienced. Um and then one of the horn players said to me, okay, calm down. <laughs> what you need to understand is... They are the front people, we are the back people, and we stay in the back. And he taught me about learning my place in the industry and all that kind of stuff. And I had no idea about this because I've been completely spoiled with the Jacks boys, like believing that I was wanted everywhere on everything because that's how they made us feel. So. I fucking hate that. It's crazy, right? I really hate that because I, th- yeah. I th- like, yeah, it's something that I struggle with massively. Mm. Um, because like I, I even struggled with it with Hallelujah. Mm. Because obviously if anybody listening doesn't know how it works, is there's a sample that's that's I've sampled and then we have to get that resung. I go to somebody that can get it resung. So I go to a guy called How, who's amazing, and he mm. kind of does all of the amazing stuff, gets everyone involved and resings, yeah. and then just kind of delivers me the resung. But I I think there's a huge part of artists, writers just not getting what they deserve in this industry. Yeah. And when when you're kind of hired to be a singer in a band, mm-hmm. it's generally because the front lot can't do the job well enough. <laughs> And they need people okay, that, yeah. and they, they need people that are really good. And you're the people that make it amazing. Oh. Well, it's true. You were, otherwise they wouldn't hire you, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we definitely were made to feel that way. We were very made very much made to feel like we were basement jacks. I remember Felix taking us to one side years and years and years later and saying, you know, you guys are basement jacks yeah. because we, we can't do what we do unless you're there. Exactly. Not really. If we're doing a DJ set, that's different. But when we're doing the live show, it's not us, it's you yeah, guys. Yeah, so yeah. You, 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 of course, say you're, you're basement jacks. And we were just like, wow, you know, 
they they had very different way of thinking about stuff you know but i think i don't th- i think that's the right way of thinking about stuff yeah, yeah. And, and it was it was it's not the norm no but it is it's is definitely because i remember we did um mtv europe awards as well years and years and years ago and there was this thing i think it still happens but there was this thing that the people on the you know on the front of the magazine or whatever they were staying in some big off posh hotel mm. and then their band and their backing singers and whoever else and their crew were staying in some no. holiday inn or whatever absolutely not so <laughs> felix was like um but they didn't tell us what had happened but yeah. we basically got there and um we were all in this holiday inn like felix and simon and everyone and we end up going to this dinner. Um, they they had kind of host all the artists the night before the awards, and the dinner was held in the hotel that everyone was staying in. Yeah. And so we get chatting to people on the table, and they're like, "Oh, you know what floor are you on? It's massive, isn't it?" Da, 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 da. Like, oh no, we're staying up the road. Yeah. And they said, "Well, why aren't you staying here?" And that's when it came out, and Felix was like, "Well, actually, they told us that we would be staying here." And our band would be staying elsewhere. So we mm. said, well, wherever our band will be, we'll be there. So yeah. we don't want to stay here separate. We want to be together. And that's, that's, that is just how it's always been. Like, we stay together. You don't put us one place and them another. We're all together or we're not here at all. Mm. So, you know, again, that's a lovely way to think about it. But unfortunately, even to this day, that's not how a lot of artists think. It's very, very separate. Um, but I miss I miss that family vibe that we had because I haven't I really haven't seen it since. And don't get me wrong, I've had a lovely time and met some beautiful people and played with some amazing artists. Um, but Basement Jacks was a very very special case, definitely. It, is it, a special case. it was a special band, um, yeah. especially in British culture, yeah. British dance music culture at that time. And to hear that they were like that is even nicer, right? And they're still like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and I think it's it's super important. I think I wish we spoke about that more. I wish yeah. I wish the industry spoke about that more because it's it's so like it's so sad the like how some people just because they have a name on a record or they're successful don't give everybody included in the record what they should if you know what i mean and it's just like it's just a greedy industry yep that people just want you know i understand like people not wanting to share something that they've made themselves by themselves but i think there's also an element of how would that thing look if it wasn't for the person singing it or the person playing it yeah how would it look because you Yes, you make music over here and then mm. you get a singer to sing your thing. But if that singer's not there, what do you actually have? Yeah. Like, what what is your track? And obviously there's loads of instrumental tracks. I remember doing a track for one, and um, with Hal as well, mm. for one artist whose name escapes me right now. But I heard it on the radio like months and months after I recorded it mm. and they'd taken the vocal off. And I was thinking, why do I know this song? Why do I know this song? And in the end, they decided to go with an instrumental version. Yeah. Um, which was, it was still amazing. It yeah. was great. But again, it's a different track. Yeah. If you put a vocal on that, it's a different track again. Completely. So, you know, people, I think people just kind of want to be able to own their own stuff because, you know, record companies tend to take a lot. Um, and the more <laughs> they have to, you know, <laughs> but the more they have to, the more that gets taken away, the less they have for themselves. So I understand what you mean about greed. But I think it's also fear. I think people have been screwed over a lot, especially mm. in this industry. And so they they just want to make sure that they're not getting screwed over so they want to keep everything. Yeah. I get it, but it's not how you... You know, they say if you want to go far, go... If you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Oh, 100%. And then you don't think like that. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. The, the people that have been around for so long, have it goes back to that community thing. And it goes mm-hmm. back to what we were talking right at the beginning of, of this podcast is that yeah. having the right people around you, whether whether it's the right management, whether it's the right agent, whether it's the right friends, whether as long as you've got the right community around you, you're going to just, it, you don't need hit records to start with. You don't need any of this. You just, just make great music and all of you have fun. Just express yourself. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Do you, have you ever had management or anything like that? Not really. Um, there was um, 
a gentleman called Graham Perkins, who I'm still friends with now, but I haven't spoken to in a long time. I need to give him a shout. But um, he was my manager for a couple of years when I did um, a Coca-Cola advert back in 2004. Mm. And he negotiated my contract, all that kind of stuff. So that was my first taste of management. Um, but I haven't really, I've mostly done everything by myself, especially yeah. where music is wow. concerned. But I do have um, a guy called Joe as well, who who's amazing. He manages Hal, mm. I really work for, and he also helps me with my contracts. If I'm doing a dance track or something, he'll be the one to look over the contract and negotiate okay. with pieces. So, but for the most part, in terms of like you know, actually finding work or doing stuff, that's mm. usually I do that on my own. That's amazing because you've done a lot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was really surprised actually because um, the same panel that I was on the other day, they started to. I'd sent them like a CV. Usually, when people mm. say, "Can you send us a CV?" I just copy and paste what's in my notes and send yeah. it. I haven't read it for a long time, so um, they were reading out like my rap sheet basically, and mm. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I forgot about that." Oh, shit, I did that as well. Oh my god, you're honest. And I was just like, "Wow, <laughs> I've actually I've been here a hot minute." <laughs> yeah, you have. But you just don't you just carry on, don't you? You just keep going and you just keep doing stuff, and you don't really think about how much you've done. Really, just having a nice time, isn't it? I think that's the thing. As long as you're enjoying it, and I don't think every part of the journey is enjoyable, but I think really? as long as you can look back at it and go, "Yeah, it was actually pretty good fun." Like yeah. it might have been really shit at the time, but <laughs> it's. It is the, the shit times are actually some of the best times because you yeah. just learn so much from it and you're like, yeah. oh wow, that happened and like, it's it's so funny. I was talking to a friend and he's having some like things going on in his life, and I'm like, mate, in five years time we're gonna be fucking laughing our socks off about this. Yep. Do that, yeah. And it's like this industry. I can't speak for any other industry because I've never been in anything else really. Like I've kind of, this is all I'd know, but you can have the biggest highs and the lowest lows in one day. Yep. For real. <laughs> for real. It's such an emotional thing, isn't it? Because everything that we do is tied up in, like we were saying at the start, like it's tied up in who we are. So everything's personal and everything's emotional and it's just a lot, man. It's a lot yeah. being an artist, isn't it? It's fun though. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there are some perks. Yeah. <laughs> so so when we when we had dinner the other day, we you you kind of slid in there that you sing at Ronnie Scott's. And I was like, okay, fucking dropping bombs over here. <laughs> so anybody that doesn't know what Ronnie Scott's is, it's probably the most famous jazz club ever, yeah. maybe. Well, Apart in the Blue Note in Japan, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's probably the most famous jazz club, which I've still yet to go. Apart from I had dinner outside, I next door to it the other night. That was the closest I've been. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did this come across? Because I don't, I don't look at you as a jazz singer. Right. I don't look at you as a jazz yeah. artist, but that's only from what I know from what you kind of portray to the public, if you know what I mean, sure. or for what I've sure. what I've heard. But how did this kind of come about? So Ronnie Scott's is, um, I'd say, home to... It is, it is a jazz club, mm. but it's definitely home to a few different genres of music, people that perform there. I went to see Lisa Fisher there. Okay. Um, I would say she's an everything singer. She's mm. the most amazing vocalist on the planet at the moment, in my opinion. But I need to check um, her out. I don't know her. Oh, she, she used to, Okay, so she is... She used to do backgrounds for Luther Vandross. Oh, wow. She um, also uh, was with the Rolling Stones for centuries. And she um, does BVs for Sting okay. as well. So I remember... It's pretty good um, then. <laughs> yeah, she's, no, she's proper. She's proper. Yeah. And she's so nice yeah. as well. She's a really lovely woman. But she's she's big out here in these streets, as, mm. as they say, as the young people say. Um, but that uh, Ronnie Scott's is a place where you can go and hear jazz, you can hear soul, you can, you know, hear all kinds of things, but mm. it's mostly kind of uh, in the in the jazz arena, um, the kind of music that you'll hear. But there's a lady called Natalie Williams, and she had a night where she was basically um, just wanted to play music with her friends and mm. play original material. So they, they, I think they started out at a place called Too Too Much, I don't think it's called that anymore. Or I don't think it exists anymore. They moved around to a, another place called Madam Jojo's. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if it was the same place that changed name, but they changed venues a couple of times and then ended up at Ronnie Scott's. Mm. 
and we have been there for the past 14 years. So um, that's kind of when I joined. And once a month on a Sunday, we play covers and we have, uh, or, or we play original material as well. And we have an artist that will come and perform their stuff too. So we've had people like Shingy, um, we've had uh, Omar, we've had um, lots and lots and lots of different people. Everybody, actually, no, give me one second. I've got a tea towel with everyone's name on it. I'm going to get it now. <laughs> and I can tell you exactly who's been on it. One sec, one sec. No rush. <laughs> Gotta love it. A... Tea towels are usually like what you do at school. In it. So this is the, this is the Soul Family tea towel. Oh, amazing. That's got everyone at the time of these making of this tea towel, everyone that had performed. So you've got Terry Walker, uh, Joey D- Dosick, a girl called Jude Pearl, who's amazing, Emily Sunday, JP Cooper, Imani Shlomo. Wow. Um, everybody. So Layla Hathaway, Kelly LaRock, Amy Winehouse, and the list goes on. So, they, they, you know, that's who's performed with Soul Family, mm. which is the name of uh, name of the, Natalie's group. So, yeah, I've been there with Natalie and Vula and uh, Ben Jones mm. as well. And the band is just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal group of musicians. And I'm very, very lucky to get to play with them once a month from time to time. Well, w- when you're back, let me know. I'm coming. Oh, no, yeah. I'm coming. <laughs> I'm bringing everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I, it's something that I've something I've, wa- I've wanted to go for years, yeah. and yeah, just never been able to get tickets. <laughs> oh no, you'll love it! You'll love it. Yeah. It's, it's a really, really fun, really fun night. How so you? How do you kind of keep up with everything you do? Because, like, I when I kind of first started working with you, I was like, okay, like Charlene does a lot of house music, and then I'm like, when I sat down with you, I was like okay, the house music is like the last thing on her list. <laughs> so like, what, what is it that, what's the like thing that you wake up to every day and you're like, okay, I, I love to do this. Like, this is what I want to do. Or, cause I know we, we spoke about lots and you're yeah. like, okay, music's not going to be my forever thing for forever. I mean, I think I, I'm definitely what this whole panorama has shown me <laughs> is that, I was a bit too relieved when all my gigs started Mm. to get cancelled. And I had to look at that because I was like, hold on, you're usually, you know, a little bit anxious when there's no work. Yeah. So why are you now suddenly relieved that there's no Mm. work? What's that? And I remember my first gig back, it was a live stream. There was no audience, but it was at Ronnie's and it was with Soul Family. And... I was in such a, a weird place and I just cried all the way there because I didn't want to go. Mm. I was so anxious about getting back on stage. And I'd had a huge amount of problems with my voice as well. I'd battered my vocal cords and there was just nothing there. So yeah. singing was actually really terrifying. So I was dealing with all of that and then basically had a year off, mm. which is what I needed. But I was not in any rush to go back yeah. do you know what i mean not to that side of it the live the live side of it and because so many people approach me to write um and to record as well so i don't mind doing you know recording singles and things like that I, i've just never really been that person that like and it sounds weird because i'm a performer but i've just never really been that person that likes to be the center of attention yeah i'm actually really shy yeah and really introverted like really introverted <laughs> so being on stage I, I try and talk to people as much, like talk to the audience as if they're my friends because yeah. I I get kind of like, oh, why are you looking at me sort of thing. I'd much rather be in the background. Um, so when I when lockdown happened, I realised that that was actually quite important to me to um, mm. not be in the front and not be looked at. Yeah. <laughs> but I still love music and I still love singing and I still want to do it. But I think I would like to um, maybe perhaps take a different um, approach. Like I've started, um, I actually got signed to an acting agent uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so I've been on a couple of auditions for different things. And I'd really, I'd really love to do that kind of thing because it's not me you're looking at, you're looking at a character. 
Yeah. You know, so, but when you're singing your own material or a cover and your own interpretation of that cover, people are looking at you. So I like the idea of singing as somebody else. But yeah. I think it's it takes the complete pressure off of being who you are, right? When you're mm-hmm. acting, you can be somebody else and people yeah. don't, people, there's very few actors and actresses out there that mm. are literally themselves when they're playing, right? That's it. Yeah. Um, apart from like unless they're doing a cameo or something yeah or like the Harry Potters like all of the yeah. actors and actresses in that like they're kind of stuck with being <laughs> them right yeah. like it's not a bad thing to be stuck at but it's kind of they can't yeah. really like Hermione what's her name Emma Watson yeah. she's a great actress but every time you see her in another film it's like well that's Hermione like Hermione. nobody yeah. else <laughs> Your yeah, get back <laughs> yeah. to Harry Potter. How <laughs> <laughs> dare you deviate? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What is that about, uh, like, human culture that we don't like to change in that sense? I think people are um, creatures, most people are creatures of habit. Mm. And if there's anything that threatens the security of habit, it can cause a lot of disruption in people's spirits yeah. i think um i'm definitely a person who loves routine um i don't really get bored with routine mm. um so and also having no routine as well like kind of the polar opposite like having absolutely nothing regular to do yeah. is great as well and as you know in our industry that's that's life yeah you, you be in india one day in ireland the next and at home the next and it's yeah. just you know so I think um, when people start to try and break out of the moulds that they've been in for quite some time, people go, what do you think you're doing? Yeah. Like, this is where you, you've always been, so this is where you must stay. Mm. And I think that people have real difficulty with the idea of people being good at more than one thing as well. Yeah. So if Hermione suddenly dig up herself and say she wants to be a dancer, everyone's like, well, who do you think you are? You're an actress and yeah. that's it. You know, it's, it's the idea of that there's a lady called Amanda Seals who I really, really admire. And she um, is a rapper. She's a comedian. I think she calls herself a comedian first. She's an actor. She is an author. Mm. Um, she, she does all these things. She's a painter. She's an artist in every sense of the word. And she's really good, good. at all of these things. <laughs> she's a DJ, everything, yeah. you know. And I think people, when they see someone like that, they're kind of just threatened by it. 100 percent you know what i mean it's like if you're good at one thing then you may only be good at one thing uh you know according to society and that's where the you know the term jack of all trades and master of none comes from isn't it it's like how could you ever be um really good at 700 things it's like you're you're, you must be superhuman and then there's jealousy and then there's you know uh, you know all kinds of things that comes with that um, so I think it, I think it's it, people tend to feel intimidated and uncomfortable with people who go, I'm not going to just stop here. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they go, why can't you just be content with where you are? Like, what's mm. you've changed? You know, yeah. it's like Jay Z said, I fucking hope I have changed because yeah. I didn't do all this hard work to stay the same. You know, so yeah, it's yeah. it's really it, I find it really important that, um, and I I battle with it myself. Is mm. it's like should I just do what people want me to do, or should I do what people what i want to do and then you kind of talk to yourself in the mirror and you're like well the only reason why i do what i do is because i love what i do Mm -hmm. and it's it is very strange in this industry um how it's kind of a clicky industry where a classic example like let's say for instance like a band like arctic monkeys Mm. they put out their first album and yeah. then they put out a second album. The second album sounds nothing like the first album. And everyone's like, what? Yeah. Everyone's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Pink had the same issue. Yeah. Like, no, 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 you're supposed to do R&B. What's going on? Yeah. 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 And then, but then I find what happens is two, three years down the line, everyone's like, oh, I love that second album. Yeah. And it's just, it's just that initial thing as human beings that taking them out of their comfort zone mm. for a short period of time Mm. like it's we, we hate it i can only speak for myself but i hate it if you know what i mean it's like oh i'm not i don't know this i don't know what i'm doing yeah. but then when you're in it and you kind of sit down with it and be like okay let's just sit by myself i'm like okay this is fun this is good yeah. exactly. 
I don't know what it's about, though. I, th- I don't think there is a single human on this earth that is completely one-dimensional. No. I mean, everybody is multifaceted. And I think there is definitely a fear, like you say, of coming out of your comfort zone. Like, mm. Even my mum, she went to buy some new glasses and uh, she's used to a certain shape of glasses and I've never really thought those glasses suit her face. Yeah. So I went with her to her, her optician's appointment and she's like, oh, I, I'm going to get these. And I was like, mum, maybe try something different. Yeah. And she was just like, okay, well, you pick me some. And the first pair I picked up, everyone was like, yes, 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 that pair. <laughs> and they really, you know, it just widened her face and brightened her, you know, the, the colour of them really suited her skin tone. And she looked lovely. Yeah. And she's always, she, even to this day, she's like, you keep taking me out of my comfort zone, keep taking me out of my comfort zone. But there's so much on the other side of the comfort zone, mm. you know? Like, we, we want to just stay here and just look around and we know, oh, I recognise that tree and I recognise those flowers. But on the other side is a whole bunch of other trees and a whole bunch of other flowers that you will never see until you come out of your comfort zone, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm all about flowers and trees. <laughs> <laughs> so, acting. Yes. Do you, do you want to do, like, films sitcoms like what's your kind of vibe or are you just like down for anything everything i want to do all of it so um back in october when i think it was the second lockdown that we had Mm. end of last year um a friend of mine called me up and said look there's this production going up and they need somebody who can sing but can also act a little bit so what you're saying i was like yeah man count me in and it was called lockdown town and I was playing the role of a woman who basically was trying to get to Tulsa. She'd heard about this community where black people were thriving and where they had their own hospitals and mm. their law firms and all the rest of it. And she was traveling, trying to get to this place where she'd heard yeah. about this place where you can have a life. And when she gets there, it's being completely destroyed. So throughout the, the play, the characters played by different women at different in different stages of life. Yeah. And I'm the last one. Yeah. And so I get to Tulsa, the place has been decimated, bombed, completely destroyed. And I have to basically, without saying, I didn't have any lines. Mm. So without saying anything, I had to show the audience that I was excited one minute and then devastated the next. And I would literally burst into tears every time I did it because I just, I love storytelling. And Mm. I felt like if I didn't cry, I wouldn't necessarily be really telling this woman's story. Um... So it was kind of a promenade play, which meant that the audience for us changed every 15 minutes. Okay. They were only in one part once throughout the whole night. So if you imagine eight times a Mm. night, I'm... (laughs) 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 It was was pretty tough. And I definitely got some extra wrinkles under my eyes from all the barling. But it was something that I really enjoyed. And people in... Actors are different. They're just... I think everyone's just a bit nicer. Yeah. Um, Singers are lovely. Don't get me wrong. I have a lot of friends who are singers and beautiful, amazing people. But I think in the acting world, because there's so much vulnerability Mm. that you have to utilize, I think everybody's just a bit kinder. I think there's so much just more emotion in that world as well. Definitely. Like people, I love that. Yeah. People talking their feelings, and I I never forget when (laughs) when I was at college. We act, like I was in the music tech department, and next to it was the acting department. Right, there was always so much drama going on in the acting department. We were like these fucking actors, just like always causing, yeah. always crying, always like having arguments. And I'm just like, they're just so real. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, how do you make yourself cry? Um, I imagine that what I'm crying about is real. So. Okay. If I, for example, there was a point in the production where I'm walking around to each, there's, I'm in a town basically, and I go to someone's house mm. and there's glass on the floor and dirt and ash and everything. And then I go to a playground and there's a swing and there's a bike there, which means there was probably a child that got killed during the bombing. Yeah. And I literally imagine that these things have happened and it makes me really sad mm. and I just start bawling. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's something that I've never understood how people do that, like actors do that like yeah. actually full-on cry there's some people that don't and you can tell that they're not yeah. but then you're like that's deep i think they call it emotion memory okay so also at the time 
I was uh, kind of coming to the end or, or getting over the end of a, of a relationship. Mm. So I found it really easy to cry anyway. I was just mad <laughs> to it all the time. So if I, if I wasn't into it one night or if I was a bit bored, I'd just start thinking about him and then I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that actually helped, <laughs> funnily enough. But, um, but yeah, if you imagine like a time when you were sad or a time when you were unhappy mm. and kind of utilize how you felt that like almost go back there in your yeah. mind and in your heart it produces an emotion. It's like when you, you, a smell that reminds you of a place. Yeah. That same kind of thing, but just, you know, with what you're doing, what's happening in front of you, if you just really think about it, it can, it can be very emotional. So what's your favorite movie? Goodwill hunting. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I've always loved that film, but I've got a few kind of close seconds. Like I really loved black Panther. Um, I've watched, I think I've watched that. I think I've watched Black Panther 11 times. Mm. I saw it at the movies five times. And then I've watched it on Disney Plus a good couple of times. And it was on Netflix at one point. So I watched it a couple of times on Netflix. So I reckon about 11. What's the lead actor's name right, that passed Tadric away? Rosen. R.I.P. Yeah, he's amazing. And all the women in that movie as yeah. well. It's just so inspiring to, to watch that film. But I think, yeah, so there's those two. What's inspiring? What's inspiring about it for you? What was inspiring for me was that there were so many black people, yeah. not drug dealers, yeah. not killing each other. Well, mm. apart from the battle scene at the end. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> there was, they were just powerful, strong women. Yeah. I'm pretty sure one of the women was gay, mm. which again, as black people, there's so much like, oh my God. Yeah. So I was really excited to see kind of a little bit of intersectionality yeah, yeah. you know it was it was nice and it's just seeing these powerful women with these men who support them being powerful yeah again it's like that's not really the norm it's like you, you men always like to ask women or well, some men i should say <laughs> but some men like to say to women oh can you cook and can you do this and that but if we were to turn around to them and say, can you build a house? Yeah. You know, it's like, if you're going to be stereotypical, go all yeah, the way with yeah. it, bro. Yeah, know? definitely. So, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, that, but yeah, that film was kind of iconic, right? For yeah. for the culture, for, yeah. for, for for world, right? For the world to be like, I don't know. There's I, I Obviously, I'm not black, so... Are you not, Will? It, I'm pretty sure you didn't gather that one, but... Uh, <laughs> You wouldn't have spoke to me, would you? It'd be like, game over. <laughs> but there's not really an iconic film that is purely based on in with black actors. I mean, there's loads of iconic black films, but, no, it's but just you know, in terms of them, yeah, in you terms know what I'm saying? Portrayed. Yeah, yeah. Terms of being portrayed as you know, strong, amazing, intelligent, creative scientific people yeah not really you know so yeah <sighs> your favorite film that annoys me as well I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it just annoys me that it's like 20 well when did it come out 2019 i think so gosh 2019 2018 no, i think no, I think it was 2018 you know let me google i gotta fact check this come on yeah when did black panther come out watch it's gonna be 2015 yeah it's gonna be like, oh <laughs> fuck we're old <laughs> 2018 yeah 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 but it annoys me that it's taken 28 it's 2018 and it's that mm. like yeah it's and there's only that yeah like i've there's some amazing films out there with like a, but a lot of it's about black history mm -hmm. that is it's very nice to to watch but it just doesn't it, it, let's move forward. Yeah. Let's move forward. Yeah. Let's kind of it's like about black trauma and black pain and mm. slavery and you know, which is, yeah. is great. It, uh, people need to talk about. It. People need to learn oh, about it. Yeah. Um, but it's like okay, that's not black people's identities. That mm -hmm. it's like, come on, people. It's just like yeah. fucking sort it out. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully, we we'll get there. Hopefully. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, my favourite film is a film called Drive. Have I seen Drive? Is that with Ryan, what's his name? Ryan Gosling. I always get confused with Reynolds and Gosling. Yeah. But yeah. 
Ryan I don't Gosling. think I've seen that. Should I watch it? Yeah, you should. It's yeah. it's a bit weird. It's like it? yeah, but I like. I like how it's done. It's like very cinematic, but also mm. the music is just unreal. Um, okay. It's Cliff Martinez that does the music. I think it's Cliff Martinez that does the music. His soundtracks are amazing. Okay. Um, but it's not like there's very little dialogue in there. It's just okay. like, yeah. It's, it's, and then it's kind of just like a action. It, it's very slow and then turns oh. like really crazy all of a sudden. It's really good. Oh. Watch it. Yeah. <laughs> it's slow and crazy you're gonna love it yeah but um yeah i guess uh what i want to go back quickly to when you were saying about taking a break from the industry and like slowing down yeah and it's something i think a lot of us not a lot of us i i can only speak for myself but i struggle with like actually relaxing and yes not, i remember you saying that to yeah, me. yeah and the lockdowns helped me a lot but what is what do you think it is for you that you just are like when you're touring you're like i'm fucking on and just keep touring what is that about for you i think it's that it's kind of an unspoken expectation mm. isn't it that when work comes in you just do it yeah um and it you know it doesn't matter if you don't like the music or if you're not sure about the artist or if you feel uncomfortable in certain situations or whatever you just it's work you've mm. got to work and you've got to pay your bills and I think you just, I think there's just the whole thing of just going from one thing to the next. And the idea of rest is very alien. And there is a lot, there used to be, I should say, a lot of guilt associated with resting. Yeah. So if someone says, um, are you free on such and such a day? And you say no, the, the assumption is that it's because you have another gig. So true. When in actual fact, it might be, well, no, I'm going to go and celebrate my mum's birthday, actually. Yeah. Or I want to spend the day in bed. It's like, how dare you not want this job? Like, yeah. what? who do you think you are? And it's that there's people who have nine to fives. If they, you know, put in and say, I need two weeks holiday, they just put their two weeks holiday in and then they go on holiday mm. for two weeks and no one bats an eyelid. Yeah. But if you do that as an artist, if you book a holiday, uh, the amount of times my friends and I have all said, I want to book this holiday, but what if work comes in? Mm. And it's like, well, then you, you just don't do that job. It doesn't mean that you're never ever, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you're never ever going to work again but that's what that's what there's kind of like this little thing in the back of my mind if I don't do this job I don't know where my next job is coming from and having literally not worked for a, pretty much an entire year yeah or done very minimal work for an entire year and still paid my rent still had food in the fridge still was able to leave the house and travel and do whatever I needed to do in terms of going to work mm. That to me spoke volumes because I, I was literally every day something. Yeah. And now to have more empty days than full feels more balanced to me. But it's not, balance is never encouraged to artists because there's there's also this thing of how dare you enjoy your work? Mm. You know, how dare you be happy on stage? How dare you be enjoying yourself with your friends whilst making money? Who do you think you are? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're supposed to hate your job. You're supposed to <laughs> hate the people you work with. Like, yeah. what's going on? And people just genuinely don't see our work as real work. Yeah, you know? it's not. I remember, I remember my mum, she came to... Um, I was touring with Emily Sunday, oh, and she came and watched a gig and I, she wanted to come and see a gig for a while, but we were on tour in Europe. So there wasn't really much happening just in the UK. Most mm. of the gigs were all across Europe. So she came to a gig in Portugal and it just so happened that once I left Portugal, I had to go and do another gig. So it was kind of a bit of a, you know, that thing where you walk off stage and you get in the car to the yeah. airport and then you get on a flight and then you go home and then you go to the other gig. It was one of those ones. And my mum had never seen that before. Yeah. She just assumed I was just having a nice time on stage and chilling with my mates. And then when she saw how hard it is mm. and how I just have been, had been, you know, doing that continuously, I think her opinion of my job changed. Changes, doesn't it? Yeah. She was like, Okay, so you've been, you do realize you've been awake for 36 hours now, yeah. right? And I was like, standard, mum, standard, don't worry. <laughs> so I drove her all the way from Gatwick to Slough back home. Yeah. And then I drove back to London to go and do my sound check. And then I did my gig. And then I slept that yeah. night. So I literally didn't sleep for two days, but that was just normal. I don't think I'll ever do that again. It's I don't think I'll do that hard again. Yeah, it's, um, 
it's really strange because it's the same in the, the DJ community as well. Like I took my dad on, on tour with me one weekend. Yeah. yeah in, what I, did you think? I'd love to take mum, but mum just wouldn't. She just, it's just not <laughs> like she, she would come to the club, yeah. but she's not great at traveling now. Um, right. But yeah, dad, he, he came to Vegas. It's, I took him on the, the like, hardest weekend as well yeah Yeah. (laughs) i took him to vegas and we literally went from vegas to austin to somewhere no detroit vegas austin vegas in like three days and like six shows in three days um and uh yeah, he got he went back home and mum texted me and was like, What have you done to your dad? He's absolutely <laughs> dead. <laughs> <laughs> and What's happened to my husband? Yeah, literally. He's dead. Um But it is. It's, I think that's the thing, is when as a I as a performer for myself, is like I want to give my all when I'm on stage. Yeah. I want to be able to people are paid to see a show yeah. right and i have to always be on when i'm on but when i'm off you don't realize that you're still not off you're like yeah. still on because you're like okay so we've just got back to the hotel it's 5 a.m in the morning i've got to be up in two hours to get on another plane for a six hour flight and then i'm gonna land get on the ho- get to the hotel eat some dinner maybe go to the gym and then go go tr- go play again and it's all over Mm. again but the difference between like my career and where you're at Mm. you're you sing and people perform during the week when they sing yeah like monday to sunday like people do tours all week long ours is generally like three sometimes four days a week but yours you guys are like as singers are just non-stop Mm -hmm. Yeah. It must fucking kill you. <laughs> it did. It yeah. really did. It was it was too much. I just I I literally um in March last year mm. I had just completed a tour and I spent the whole tour without any voice. Yeah. And had to have an emer- like I I call it an emergency um vocal lesson with my friend Annie Williams and she she actually saved me because I couldn't figure out how to position my vocal cords to make the sound come out. Mm. And she had to basically show me how to do that because everything was bruised. Mm. Everything was bruised. And I had a lot of tension in my jaw and in my neck and in my shoulders and my back and everything. And everything hurt. It hurt to sing. But I was on tour. I was being paid. Yeah. And what are you going to do? You can't just, oh, I'm going to go home. I don't feel well. Again. That's not something that people in nine to fives have to worry about. If they don't feel well, they go home, they work from home. I can't. Can't work do that. Home. You know, well, I do work from home now as a singer. It's great. But yeah. <laughs> at the time, you can't tour from home. Do you know what I mean? No, but, yeah. But yeah, so it, it was actually very damaging. Mm. And I think I did not realize how much damage I was doing. And that's why I just kept going. But since I've stopped, now I'm like, how could I have yeah. done that? The thing that, the thing that worries me is that because I, I agree, like, I've been talking to a lot of mates and we're like, okay, so, like, we're touring here. Let's, like, take a whole week out and, like, spend time here. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm really scared because I know it's not going to fucking happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, we, we I don't know, but I can only speak for myself, but I talk this big game that, like, <laughs> I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to... Like I, <laughs> I spoke to my manager the other day, and I'm one of my first shows back is a show in Pennsylvania in like a fest a fens- festival in in America, yeah. and I was like, I'm gonna like drive up with my with a couple of friends, spend a couple of days at the festival, and like then play my show and then fly off to do another festival. And my manager was like, Will, you're gonna hate going to the festival. <laughs> you're gonna really like. Why are you doing it? Like take time out somewhere else mm. and don't go to the festival and just go to the festival, play a set and leave because otherwise you're just going to start hating it again. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to do it, people. Yeah, right. Charlene yeah. Hector, we've just done an hour. Yay! 
Smash it. Aaron tin wagon. Yeah. Um, could go on forever, but um, you've you've got to nurse your hangover. <laughs> Trust me, as soon as we are done, all this makeup is coming off my face. All of the coming out, I'm getting back into my bed. What? I'm, I'm so sorry for dragging you out on a. <laughs> no, no, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. I was like, I've just got one thing to do today. Just one thing. I'm going to be all right. It's going to be fine. Um, before we end, how can people follow you, listen to you, do all of that? Let's do the. the um, so on Instagram, I am Super Shah. That's S U P A S H A R, um, and that's about it, really. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, you can hear my stuff. Just type my name into Spotify, and you can also hear um, "Hallelujah" by DJ Will Clark. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to, I, I want to close off. You also make candles, and I still haven't I ordered any. Like, how can people t- smell these amazing candles? Right. So I also, again, on Instagram, um, my account is called Merle and Letter. So Merle is M E R L E, and then you go underscore. A N D and letter is L E T T E no R. Letter is actually a Dutch name, and letter is the name of the lady who taught me how to make candles. And Merle is my mum's name. So Amazing. Just so yeah, Merlin Letter. People always go Merlin Leet, Merlin uh, Lump. Merlin Lump. <laughs> I'll put it. I put all the links in the below. Thank in you. the below, people. So help yourself to make some candles and uh mate so good to talk catch up um my darling and let me know if you need anything keep safe and (laughs) see you soon i mean ibuprofen will (laughs) (laughs) i get one of those do we is there like deliver delivery doctors now nowadays (laughs) there has to be (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh I've had such a lovely time. Thank you, my darling. Love you, mate. Keep safe. All right. See you soon. Bye. And that is a wrap. I absolutely love that podcast. I hope you did. Please go follow her. Please give her all the love. She's the best. Um, Send this out to everyone. If you are listening, thank you for listening. Keep safe. And I'll see you next time. Big love.